thanks for coming. So today we are going to have an impact on you all sat here to talk about code, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a longer title even than this one, but I didn't want to put it on the slide. Yeah, so thanks for coming. I'm happy to be here. I'll talk about um, two results related to graph classes where we restrict what kind of length the induced cycles of the graph are allowed to have. Um, so just to start off with, the most important definition is um, a hole, which is an induced cycle of length at least four. Um, so just to review, this would be a hole. The blue vertices on this would be a hole, and this graph doesn't contain a hole. Um, uh, so the outline of the talk, of course, at the beginning, I'll talk a bit about the related work and history. And then I'll talk about the first result, which is a algorithm to um, determine whether an input graph contains a hole that is even and of length at least L for some constant L. L is not part of the input. And so when L is not part of the input, it is polynomial time. Um, but the exponent does depend on L. Um, so formally, uh, that's the definition, and then the I'm going to frequently use long to mean length at least L for both paths and cycles. Um, and the second result is the structure of graphs when every hole in the graph has the same length. Um, and we call these graphs uh, L monohold if every hole in that graph has length exactly L. Um, and we are able to describe their structure for every integer L at least seven. Um, so there's some obvious open problems there. Um, I think L equals six is, should be doable. L equals five, um, I believe uh, Paul Seymour and Sophie Sperkle are have pretty much solved. Um, L equals four Sophie four three graphs, I think that should be really difficult. Um, so, all of the work I have done was joint with Paul Seymour. Um, for the second result, it gets interesting because another group independently was working on this problem. So that's Horsfield, Kreisman, Sintiari, Roban, Trotinon, Vushkovic. And now all of us write a paper together. And we actually only find that found out because I emailed Nicola Trotinon about some advice about applying to postdocs and told him what I was doing. And he was like, oh, uh, I'm doing the same thing. So, but it's nice because you can be extra sure of this result because two groups independently got the same answer. Um, but the same length, how do you combine the two Well, we, Paul and my group won out with, <laughs> it's written under our style, but we found that they're, they're equivalent. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so the history, so basically all this field started with um, perfect graphs, um, which just to review, um, in case you haven't seen it before, are graphs where the chromatic number and the clique number are equal for that graph and also every induced subgraph of that graph. And this notion was introduced by Berge in the uh, 60s, and he conjectured that a graph is going to be perfect if and only if it doesn't contain an odd induced cycle or the complement of an odd induced cycle. And um, this became a really well-known conjecture called the strong perfect graph conjecture and it was a huge area of study for 40 years. And during this time, people kind of got interested in looking at um, how holes in a graph affect its overall structure as a means to um, trying to prove the strong perfect graph theorem. So the um, first result of this kind was from 2002. Um, Michel Orti, Gerard Kondjo, AJ Kapoor, and Christina Vushkovic um, got a structural decomposition theorem for even whole free graphs. And um, they used this decomposition theorem in order to get an algorithm to recognize whether a polynomial time algorithm to recognize whether or not a graph is even whole free. And um, all of this was motivated by, they, they wanted to prove the strong perfect graph conjecture. Um, the idea was that if they spent enough time working with even whole free graphs, they would be able to develop some techniques that they could then apply to graphs that don't contain an odd hole or a complement of an odd hole. The reason this makes sense as a strategy is because even whole free graphs 
pretty much don't contain any complements of odd sort holes except for the whole of length phi. Um, because every um, odd hole of length seven or more has an induced two edge matching, which means that in the complement there is a hole of um, length four, so it would not exist in an even hole free graph. Um, and this initial algorithm kind of opened up this field of people trying to find algorithms to finding holes of basically any parity and um, extra specification you can think of. Um, so there's a bunch more results of that nature that I'll get into shortly. And then I should, of course, mention the strong perfect graph theorem was actually finally proved in 26, uh, 2006 by Trudowski, Seymour, Robertson, and Thomas. And they did this by, again, getting a structural decomposition theorem for graphs that don't contain an odd hole or a complement of an odd hole. So talk a bit about what kind of algorithmic questions people have thought about in terms of detecting holes. So if does G contain a hole, it's pretty trivial to get a polynomial time algorithm. You can just use Dijkstra. Um, there's been some work to get it to go faster. So you can get it to be linear in the number of um, vertices plus the number of edges by a result of Tarjan, Luker, and Rose from like the 1980s. Um, and then significantly harder is, um, does G contain a hole of a specific parity? So the even hole result I mentioned, the odd hole result was open for a very long time. It got solved in 2018. And, um, People had prior to that actually like thought it might be NP-hard. And so then there's another variant which people have also worked on that say if you have an even hole, you would like to know the length of the shortest even hole and the same question for odd holes. And then the question of this talk is um, can you find get an algorithm to find a long even hole? And as far as I know, that is every variant of the um, even an odds holes problem that has been thought of so far, although they keep seeming to pop up. I'm really looking forward to the shortest long even holes algorithm. Um, so I'll get a bit into the history for the even holes detection algorithms, because there's been a bunch of them. So as I mentioned before, it started with this structural decomposition theorem. Um, and um, then they were able to obtain an algorithm from using that. It should say approximately n to the 40, not n to the 40, because actually the co-authors never bothered to um, figure out the running time. They were just concerned about it being a polynomial. And um, as far as I can tell, no one has actually gone through and calculated the exact time since, since there's been a bunch of much faster algorithms. So uh, a couple years later, um, Maria Trudnowski, Kenichi Kawa Rabayashi, and Paul Seymour got a slightly faster algorithm. But um, what's interesting is they used an entirely different approach. They didn't get a structure, use a structural decomposition theorem for even whole free graphs. Instead, they kind of dealt with the graph directly. Um, at this point in talk, it shouldn't be overly clear what that means. But um, our approach for long even holes that uses a somewhat similar methodology. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll actually um, be able to trust me when I mean it's more direct. Um, and um, the fact that it's used, does this more direct approach without using the even hole free graphs makes it more adaptable to other settings. Um, so it's able to do the shortest long even hole problems with a similar technique because it doesn't actually use a decomposition theorem and also the long even holes um, problem because it doesn't depend on this decomposition theorem for even hole free graphs because I guess the equivalent for long even holes you would probably need a decomposition theorem for graphs that don't contain a long even hole which does not exist um, so this seems to be the more flexible approach but um, it's not the fastest all of the faster algorithms for even hole free graphs are using this decomposition approach so in 2008 the Silva and got a n to the 19th algorithm by getting a stronger decomposition theorem and then using that decomposition. And then there's been subsequent improvements using that same new decomposition theorem. So in 2015, Cheng and Liu um, reduced the runtime further by um, using the same decomposition theorem of Desilva and Vujkovic, but um, making the algorithm a bit more clever. 
and um, then very recently Lai Lu and Thorup, um went, basically they made a subroutine that's used in a lot of these subgraph detection algorithms uh, very fast. And so now they hold the record for all kinds of things, including the even holds algorithm. Um, the subroutine they improved is called the three in a tree problem. I will describe it later because we also use that subroutine. Um, so uh, just to describe the history again, I've already done the even hole stuff. So odd hole stayed open for longer. Um, and then the next year, um, Maria Chernowski, Alex Scott, and Paul Seymour got a n to the 20L plus 43 algorithm to detect a um, odd hole of length at least, least L. Um, and they used a really, so, okay. Um, they used a very similar approach to the original odd holes problem. They were just a little bit more careful at some of the steps to make sure that um, they actually end up with the short, with um, a long odd hole. Um, and then in 2019, uh, Paul and I got a n to the 9L plus 3 algorithms to detect a long even hole. I don't really believe that the um, 9L plus, so, the, uh, so we spent a decent amount of time trying to optimize the runtime to get n to the 9L plus 3. I think there's a couple steps where n to the 20L plus 43 could also have been reduced, but um, in general, since it's this like exponent to the something times L, like nobody really cares too much what the constants are because you can't really run it in practice anyway. Um, and for all of these, n is the number of vertices on the input graph. Um, so here's a table of the best known results for um, various uh, options. I've talked about most of them. So for the odd hole result from Lai Lu and Throp, that's again, they basically took the algorithm from Chudnowski, Scott, Seymour, and Sperkle and um, applied their better subroutine and did a couple other things more carefully to get the best runtime. And the same thing for the even holes, that's Chang and Liu's algorithm, plus um, they improved uh, a lot of the um, subroutines they're calling. Um, and so for the shortest even hole, that is basically Chang and Liu went through the old version of the long even holes algorithm by um, Chudowski, Kavara, Bayashi, and Seymour very carefully and found that it actually does detect the shortest um, even hole. Um, so that was an excellent rediscovery on their part. Um, and um, then, of course, I just put in the uh, running times for holes of any parity um, just for comparison. Um, so an important thing to note is that the this dependence on L in the exponent for the long um, holes problems, we don't expect to be able to get rid of that unless um, some theoretical computer scientists are very surprised. They're both W1 hard. I'll explain what that means further in a minute. Um, and similarly for just the long holes problem in general, regardless of the parity, um, if you consider L to be a part of the input, that is NP hard. Um, so give you the proof. So the reduction for uh, the problem like asking if G has a long even hole or a long odd hole or also just a long hole is NP hard um, by reduction from Hamilton cycle. So what you do is you just substitute, subdivide every edge and then just you could apply the long even holes algorithm on um, two times the vertex set. It's the easiest reduction ever. If it's odd, you can just subdivide every edge twice. So replace every edge with a three edge path and do the same thing for 3L. Um, uh, 
Um, so in terms of the W1 hard, uh, the proof of this was actually emailed to Paul by a, um, at the time, an Iranian an undergraduate from Iran. Now he's a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Um, so <laughs> can thank him if I ever need him. Uh, and so he actually proved something stronger that it's W1 hard to find a long hole of any specific residue. And um, W1 hard basically means that it's as hard as anything in the class of FPP, which is, you don't know it, it's sort of similar to um, N P and NP. Um, and so we strongly conjecture that W1 does not equal FPP, but um, if we had such a polynomial time algorithm, it would equal um, FPP. So we'd be very famous in um, parameterized complexity theory. Um, so I should also mention at this point, it's a little bit surprising that any of these results are um, are polynomial times. So in the 1989 team stock, proved that it's NP hard to determine if you have an input graph and a specific vertex in the graph, is there an odd hole or an even hole um, passing through that specific vertex? Um, which actually ends up implying that many induced subgraphs you can draw on your paper are NP hard to detect, because um, lots of them would imply that. Um, I should also mention here that it's obviously polynomial time to determine whether or not a graph contains a um, hole with a prescribed vertex, because you can um, just guess its neighbors on the cycle um, and then go through with Dijkstra. Okay, so uh, now I'll finally actually describe the um, long even holes algorithm. So I first want to give the, well, here's the formal result, but I've said it like 10 times already, so um, I think it's okay. Um, so I first want to give the uh, main idea, which uh, is something we would like very much to be true, um, which is if you have a um, shortest, a uh, long even hole, and you pick any two vertices on the path that you and take a shortest path between them, that you could somehow substitute this path to get a new long even hole. So um, this would yield a trivial algorithm to detect uh, long even holes because what you could do is um, enumerate all triples of vertices. And for the first pair, take a shortest path between them um, and um, delete everything that it has neighbors in the interior of the path. Um, and then take a shortest path between the next two pairs and again, delete everything that has neighbors in the interior of the path and take a shortest path between the third pair. Um, and if you've um, chosen the vertices so that they um, are pretty much equidistant on a shortest long even hole, by applying that algorithm. So the first time if you delete it, so just by replacing this path, we know there's another or shortest long even hole. And um, then again, since this is the shortest long even hole, if you apply that um, lemma again with the new shortest path, um, you can replace this um, path by um, this new path and get a shortest long even hole. And you can do the same thing for the third. So um, just by taking shortest paths between every three sets of vertex, if there is a long even hole in the graph, there should um, be one that you can find in just this trivial way. So the only downside of this lemma is that it's like super not true. Um, <laughs> so like, really easy thing you can think of is say if this is your shortest long even hole, you have a single vertex and it has edges really far apart. Um, you could also have something weirder like say some attachment and a path and maybe this is shorter or the long par wrong parity and 
the same thing with say like maybe replace this with a path. Um, so the idea is that we're going to pre-process the graph um, so that this thing will finally hold. So essentially we're able to eliminate every case where anything bad happens um, and um, once all of that is gone it's actually pretty easy to prove that this dream lemma holds. Um, and it's a really fun way to try to prove a theorem because anytime you get in trouble, you can just get rid of the thing that you don't like. Um, so the first really bad thing is called a major vertex. So it's basically what I drew over here. Um, it's any vertex you can have that doesn't have its neighborhood contained on the whole in a three vertex path. And we call it clean if there are no C major vertices. So in the picture, all of the blue vertices are C major and the red vertices are not C major. And so, right, so since their neighbors are too far apart, they themselves are like the short possible shortest path between two vertices on the cycle that's a lot shorter than either um, side of the cycle. So the blue ones have their neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. So the red ones are okay because they don't really like have very complicated neighbors. But the idea is at the end of the algorithm, we'll take shortest paths. And the issue is if there's a major vertex, maybe your shortest path is just the major vertex. And then the rest of, then you don't get a new hole. So I mentioned the approach. So the first thing we do is test for easily detectable configurations, um, which basically there's certain graphs that contain long even holes and, um, and that we can search for in polynomial time. And um, since they contain long even holes, we can assume the graph doesn't contain any of them. And that gives us a bit more structure to work with for the rest of the graph. And then we get rid of major vertex vertices through a process called cleaning that I'll describe in the next slide. And once we have all of that, um, so no major vertices plus no easily detectable configurations, we can actually prove that this dream lemma is true. And we can just test for shortest long even holes by enumerating every triple of vertices and taking shortest paths between them. Uh, So cleaning is a technique introduced by Kunforti and Rao in the 90s, I think. Um, and the idea is that you branch into um, polynomially many problems, uh, subproblems where one of them has the properties you want. Um, so in this case, um, you would get a list of polynomial lengths um, of vertices um, where something in the list contains all the C major vertices and none of the vertices from C, so you can delete it safely. Um, and then once you get rid of it, that hole is a clean, shortest, uh, long even hole. And this technique is used in a lot of um, induced subgraph detection problems. So now I want to talk, uh, introduce the easily detectable configurations. So the first one is very easy, um, which is, uh, oh, sorry, the case should be L's, um, but um, it's long even holes of length at most some bound for the purposes of the talk. None of the bounds I'm going to say will matter, um, and we can just detect them by enumerating every set of um, size at most to uh, L. The next one is a bit more complicated to describe. So the idea is uh, you have three paths going between vertices U and V. Um, two of them are Q1, Q2. They have to have different parity, but they can have any relationship. They can share vertices, have edges between them. But the third path between U, V, P has to be um, disjoint and non-adjacent to any of the vertices. Um, in Q1, Q2, so that Q1 union P and Q2 union P is a whole. And so that'll definitely contain a long even hole, because one of um, 
P1 and Q2 have some of the same parity of P, so um, those together would be a um, long hole. And um, we bound their, we call their order the length of the maximum length of P1 and Q2, and we search for ones with bounded orders for the purposes of this algorithm, the magic number we needed ended up being L plus one, but uh, I don't think it's necessary to understand the exact value for the purposes of this talk. So the way we find them is we enumerate all possible Q1, Q2s, and then the first L minus two um, vertices of P. And um, we take, so everything I've drawn in blue, um, we delete those vertices and all of their neighbors, and then we add back the W and B, and then we can test with, say, Dijkstra um, that there, if there's a WB path in that graph, and since we deleted anything that could possibly have bad edges to the rest, if there is such a graph, then we could just, if there is such a path, then we could just add it back um, and that would be a long deal. So you're assuming that Q1 and Q2 are the same? Uh, no. So when I say guess, I mean enumerate all possible sets of that size. Oh. Yeah. So Q1 and Q2, there's a bound on how big they can be. So we just like enumerate every set of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I should have defined that. I use the word guess a lot to mean enumerate. Um, so our, our algorithm like really, really depends on L being in the exponent because we're constantly like enumerating every set of like size something times L. Um, it's maybe possible that the actual dependence isn't linear. Maybe it's some other function times N to the, in the exponent, um, but definitely nothing in our algorithm would work that fast. Okay, so the next one's a bit more complicated, so probably you've seen it. So a theta is a graph that consists of two vertices, so u and b, and three um, internally disjoint and non-adjacent paths between them. And it has to contain the long holes because it's two of the three paths have to have the same parity, and so together they would be in long even hole an even hole, sorry. And we call a theta long if every hole in the theta is um, long. And uh, they're detectable in poly time using a um, algorithm called the three in a tree algorithm, which uh, is this subroutine I mentioned from Lilu and Sarab. Um, I'll describe it in the next slide. So the three in a tree problem is if you're <laughs> Given an input graph and given three specific vertices, the question is if there's some kind of tree, maybe like this, or a path that contains, induced tree that contains those three vertices. Um, and that was solved by Chernovsky and Seymour in 2006, and they got an n to the fourth algorithm by, they got a decomposition theorem for um, graphs which do not. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's nice to have background music. Um, <laughs> uh, graphs that do not uh, contain such an induced tree, um, which they turns out they sort of behave kind of like a line graph. They're script structure, so they can't behave like a line graph of a bipartite graph. Um, and uh, then in 2019, as I have mentioned, Lilu and Sarap, um so 2020 is when they published it, 2019 is when they put it up on the archive, um, got a n squared log squared n algorithm for it. And the way they did this was by, um, go, they also used the decomposition theorem. They just improved upon the decomposition theorem of Chernovsky and Seymour, and then also made bits of the algorithm more efficient. Uh, graphs which do not contain an induced tree containing three pre-specified vertices. So they actually extended it to like more, a greater number of vertices. 
And so we can use this algorithm to detect long thetas. Um, and the idea is that you enumerate the bottom part of every theta, um, the exact values of the links uh, don't really matter. Um, and then for each such possible bottom part of a theta, you delete everything that might have neighbors inside here. Um, and then you add these vertices back, and then you run the three in the tree algorithm on the, this new graph. And I think it's pretty easy to see if there's like a tree containing these three, or maybe like a path, then this would be a, a long theta. So more formally. So more formally for every guess we go through and um, make this, uh, so we enumerate every possible you know, beginning of a theta for each time we delete all their neighbors and add the ends back in, then we run three in a tree on that. And then if any of them ever say there is a, such a tree, then there must be such a theta, there must be a long theta. And if uh, we get to the end and none of them have outputted that there is a tree, we can, uh, there is no long theta in the graph. So this works because we have cleaned up the graph up to the two error, correct? Yeah, yeah, because you guess, you just guess so long. In the beginning, you already tried to detect all, all those links and most of the two error, right? So that's... I don't know. It's not dependent on any... Yeah, so... I was curious whether you have a delicate way to go on that. No, I mean, so these are just to make it a bit faster. We could be much more stupid and just enumerate every set of size at most, say like 3L, and um, maybe you've guessed the whole theta in that set, but in that case, you're happy anyway. Um, yeah, but the next one is a little bit delicate. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, so this is a graph we call Van the Bomb. So the dashed lines um, represent a path of um, positive length. Um, it's called Van the Bomb for uh, because it looks vaguely like the British nuclear disarmament sign. Um, <laughs> so, um, and um, so it will contain a, um, long even hole because, um, right, there's three holes in the graph. So there's the big one, and then there's these two small side ones, and, um, the way the parodies add up, one of the three has to be, um, even. And, and we call a bend the bomb long if every hole in it is long, but, Again, as I mentioned before, you could be a bit more stupid and call it long if every path in it is long, which generally makes the algorithms easier to describe, but um, the runtime worse. And that's detectable in um, polycon using the three in the tree algorithm again. And we do a similar thing where you guess the beginning of it and you guess the, like, the first maybe L vertices in each way and then you delete everything inside it and um, run the three in a tree algorithm on these three vertices um, and if you end up with a tree like this then it's great that is a long band the bomb and if you end up with a tree like this that can't happen because that's a long theta um, if you delete this vertex um, so the next one, if you've ever seen a prism, this is essentially the same thing. The idea is you have um, two triangles. Um, first case, they're both vertex disjoint, and you have paths going between um, the two triangles. Um, but for the purposes of this algorithm, it was also helpful for us to include the four wheel. So we allow two of the triangles to have the same vertices. Um, and again, we call it long if all those are long. So yeah, 
easily if technical configuration is not a great name um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, so in 2013, Frederick Meffre and Nicolas Trottignon uh, strengthened this result of um, Beanstalk uh, by showing that it's still empty hard to see if there's a hole going through two specific vertices. Um, even in a triangle free graph, and also if those two specific vertices have to have degree two. Um, they basically went through Beanstalk's proof and did everything a bit more carefully to make it work. Um, and that means it's MP hard to determine whether or not a general graph has a long prism, because you can do a reduction like this. Um, so if you could tell whether or not that bigger graph has a long prism, then that means that u and v must be in some cycle together in G, and then you could um, solve the and hard problem. Uh, but luckily for us, we can assume that G doesn't have any long thetas or long bandle bonds, so we're not working with a general graph. And um, I do want to mention that the important thing is that G doesn't have any long thetas. We use the fact that it uh, doesn't have any long band the bonds, but I believe our algorithm still works without that assumption. It's just uh, we would have to adjust things to make it slower. In the first draft of this paper, we didn't use this extra assumption, and I don't think we need it, but it makes the running time blow up to like n to the 108l plus something. So um, <laughs> we. Um, so in. Uh, 2008, um, Chernowski, Maria Chernowski and Rohan Kapadia uh, proved that if there is a input graph G without thetas, they can get a um, prism. So a prism is basically the same thing as a near prism, except they actually have to, the triangles have to actually be vertex disjoint. And um, we proved something similar, except in the long case. Um, and uh, we weren't, their techniques didn't directly work for our scenario, but we were able to use a somewhat similar algorithm structure. And um, should also mention that this bit is the, was the hardest part to prove. Once we got this, we got everything else in like the long even holes algorithm in I think a day. Um, and um, it's also the computationally most expensive step. So the actual asymptotic running time just depends on our ability to test for long near prisms. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of um, the proof for testing long near prisms because it's like a microcosm of the um, entire proof. Um, so the first thing we do is we kind of get the like top and bottom of um, the prism. Um, so the bases plus the first L vertices. If the paths happen to be less than L, that's great, because then we've guessed the entire path. And that makes our life much easier. Um, so this picture is a little bit misleading, because it suggests that um, all three triangles are vertex disjoint and all three paths are long. But like, if that is not the case, then we've guessed even more of the prism and we're even happier. Um, and we call it tidy if um, the frame doesn't have any neighbors outside of the um, prism it's in, and we can assume it's tidy by just enumerating all possible frames and deleting everything that has neighbors in the interior of, of the paths. Um, and so again, we want to do something similar where we would like to get um, shortest paths from S to T and S2 to T2 and S1 to T1. And ideally, we would like these shortest paths to um, end up being a prism, but maybe they could have weird interactions and it wouldn't be induced anymore. Um, so uh, similar to the um, cycle case, the bad thing that can happen is a major, one of the bad things that can happen is a major vertex. So it's the same definition, but on a prism. So in the picture, the blue vertices are major and the red vertices are not. And a um, prism is clean if there are no C major vertices. So uh, cleaning, uh, so essentially we do the same cleaning magic for prisms. Um, and this is the bit where we heavily used it 
uh, the graph doesn't contain any long zetas. So I want to give the main idea, even though it's a bit annoying, um, to state. So for a major vertex, uh, we had to introduce this concept called extreme neighbors, which are the ones that are closest to the ends of every path. Um, so in the picture, all the red vertices are the extreme neighbors of X. And we call exterior neighbors everything that's to the outside, so it's not in between the two extreme neighbors on the path, so it's everything that's highlighted in blue. And um, then we look at, say, X and Y are major vertices. We call it distance if it doesn't have any neighbor close along any of the path to an extreme neighbor. Um, the exact definition of close doesn't really matter here. It's You can think of it as distance L away. We can actually get a little bit better than distance L. Um, but it doesn't super matter. And then through a lot of struggle, we finally realized that if um, you have um, two non-adjacent vertices with neighbors on a tie, um, a shortest long near prism with a tidy frame, um, and x is distant from y, then um, y has to have exactly two x exterior neighbors, and they have to be adjacent. So I guess if this is x, the example would be like if y must have two perfectly adjacent neighbors here, and it can have whatever neighbors it wants inside the interior neighbors of x but we know it has to have it exactly two somewhere in this range or in the blue range in the picture. Um, and that's a strong enough pattern that we're able to figure out by carefully choosing major vertices, how they all have to attach in the graph and end up being able to find, uh, get a bound on the size of the set, set X. Um, and then we're able to enumerate all sets of that size, and well, one of them has to work. Um, so uh, just a sketch of the rest of the proof quickly. Um, so as I mentioned before, we can assume it doesn't have any easily detectable configurations, and so once we have that structure, we're able to, again, get a similar pattern as what we found for the prism case um, for C major vertices in a shortest long even hole and then we can get a bound on that size and do cleaning. And once we have that, the dream lemma holds. Um, um, the proof of that is actually pretty straightforward. It's a little bit long, but some of the most obvious thing that you can think of at every point in the proof works. Um, so related open problems. Um, the big one is, uh, for which values of P and Q, is it poly time to detect whether or not a graph contains a whole of length P mod Q? Um, Paul and I tried to think about zero mod three for a little bit, but we didn't really get anywhere. One of the reasons we like zero mod three is um, because of this uh, nice properly property they have um, that tell I Michelin conjecture that the number of odd sets um, and the number of even sets are only at most one different. Um, and also, if you if a graph doesn't contain any triangle, then that's a nice structural condition that we hoped to be able to use to determine um, whether or not there are any cycles of length zero mod three. So yeah, now I'm going to very quickly talk about this, but I also don't like talking about this result very much, so it really worked out in my favor. Um, <laughs> So, uh, again, monohold if they all have the same length. Um, and we get a structural description of them. And this yields a poly time recognition algorithm for this class of graph. Uh, the particular polynomial is n to the seventh, but I didn't want to put it on my slide because we're still writing that part out. So, um, so the really basic ways you could um, in large graphs that are monohold are if you um, you can paste them together along a complete cut set or add a vertex that's complete to everything else, which we call a universal vertex, or replace a vertex with a cleat. 
Um, so some easy examples, uh, graphs without any holes, cycles, and then um, statas and prisms and pyramids is essentially the same thing for the odds, so I didn't really went over there. And uh, here are some weirder possibilities. So you can get this kind of like blow up of a cycle. Um, you can have this kind of like almost a prism, but also very confusing um, thing. Uh, and then even on small numbers of vertices, you can end up with these kind of strange things that sort of behave like prisms and thetas and pyramids, but also sort of don't. Um, and uh, that ends up being the truth uh, that, so either it'll be, have a clean cut set or universal vertex, or it'll be this um, kind of blown up version of a cycle that I'll define in a second, or it's this uh, weird generalization of a prism theta or a pyramid. I pull 5.30? Yeah, oh, <laughs> 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 So I guess I'll just define blow up of a graph. So the idea of, of blow up of a graph is that you replace every vertex with a clique and you replace edges with half graphs. Um, so half graphs are graphs without an induced two edge matching. Um, and right, place edges with connected half graphs. Um, and we also need to introduce this notion of compatible half graphs, which uh, basically means that um, in every, if you have a clique um, and several incident edges, um, the clique and all of its neighbors are still form another half graph. So in other words, the vertex in that clique with the most neighbors going to um, each of the half graphs, going to all of any half graph will also have the most neighbors going to um, each of the specific half graphs. Um, and that's important for keeping the holes the same length. Like if we didn't have this property along this um, C5-ish thing, then um, we could get a C6 by um, taking an edge from inside a clique. Um, yeah, and a blow up of a graph is replacing edges with connected half graphs and um, edges are incidents if they're replaced by a connected half graph. Um, Okay, so a very rough idea about an L framework is that uh, you have an arborescence on the top and bottom and you have a um, bunch of vertex disjoint paths going um, from top to bottom and we know their length. Um, there's a ton of current conditions about what the arborescences have to look like and um, what the relationship, like for the even case, the paths can have one of two lengths, and that also relates to what the two arborescences look like. Um, so I'll just skip over all the conditions because I want to get to my more vague thing, but <laughs> I think Keynote is not allowing me to skip through this very quickly. Um, and it sort of keeps going. Um, and upsettingly, this is only some of the conditions. I skipped some <laughs> things. <laughs> and so the very rough idea of blowing up an L framework is you take the um, transitive closure of the top and bottom arborescence. So that means for every uh, edge that's going from, every path that's going from the root to um, a leaf, you replace that with a cleat. And now you take a blow up of this graph. This is a little bit of a lie because um, mm -hmm. In a general blow up, we allow any kind of connected half graphs. However, in this, in certain edges in the arborescence, we need that half graph to be um, a complete graph um, if there was an edge. Uh, but there's again, like another page of um, conditions for this. And in the version of my talk where I finished on time, I assumed you would have been so sick of hearing all the conditions that um, <laughs> you wouldn't want to hear this. But, um, that's the idea. Um, and the proof was kind of done by looking at uh, these uh, minimally connected sets that have some stable set in them and uh, seeing 
how, like, if you have two of them on the same set of verdicts that are otherwise um, anti-complete, what their structure is, and without too much work, actually, we can get their structure for every graph, um, every L at least seven, and um, we're also able to prove that it has to have one of this pair because um, basically if it's not a blow up of a hole and it's not portal and it's not a vertex, then it has to have a prism theta or a pyramid, which is exactly one of these. Because um, you have a cycle somehow and you somehow have to have some other path that somehow has to connect in some way and that's how you get it. Um, and so we get the um, biggest mated K spider for maximum K and then we choose a maximal flow of an L framework com um, containing that, and then we uh, do lots and lots of case work, um, and then there's nothing else in the graph. Um, and yeah, so stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, so what if you, uh, like in the second part, yeah. if you say all odd holes have lengths L and then like all holes, then uh, is there a chance that some of this can be generalized? I Yeah, I, I think there's a chance that some of this technique can be generalized, but I guess at least my hope when we started this problem was that this would be a nice, easy to understand class of graphs, which is kind of true in the fact that we can get a structure theorem for it. But I imagine if you add even more possible holes it could have, you might have to use, because um, the only decomposition we really use is the smooth cut set. So maybe you would have to use some like stronger decomposition, like maybe you need a two join or something. We have a quest from, question from Ojong. Is there a polytime uh, algorithm to test whether a graph contains two vertex disjoint even holes? Um, I don't, as far as I know, um, that has not been studied. Uh, that feels a little, because there are, Yeah. I, I, my guess is that it would be ending hard by a result of these stuff, but I'm not able to do the <laughs> reduction on them. <laughs> but yeah, if you email me tomorrow. What's the complexity of the whole in a tree problem? Of the three in a tree problem? Instead of that, a four in a tree problem. Four, four I, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think at some point it becomes anti-hard, um, but I don't remember. So uh, if we try to like, expand this parity thing to modular 3, yeah. what's the biggest issue? Uh, easily detectable configurations. Because uh. for the, our strategy is quite nice because like, you, know, you divide an odd number into two, one of the numbers has to be odd, but for um, modulo 3, it's hard even to think of any easily detectable configuration that isn't anti-hard by these dots results that um, have to have a whole of link to 0 mod 3. So I'm not really sure that um, our approach is the, this easily detectable configuration cleaning approach is going to be the answer for 0 mod 3. Let's thank the speaker again.